Hi, it's Greg Gorner, Accountant Corps, Genuity Wealth Management, and Gorner Wealth Management. We're here to help you make some sense out of your financial lives. Now, joining me today is going to be Accountant Corps, Genuity Technology Analyst, Robert Young. Welcome, Robert. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on. Hey, well, th thanks for joining. Uh, always get, get great feedback for your segments here. Um, I mean, the world is changing fast here. Now, um, a couple of things. You're looking at the enterprise software area, the SaaS uh, area. I mean, we've got some high valuations and uh, we've got a big shift onto e-commerce. Can we talk a little bit about that? Do you think this is the where things are going or if there's going to be a little bit of a retrenchment going forward here? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, valuations uh, have been high for a while. I think there was a little bit of a, you know, the tech indices have weakened a little bit since the beginning of December. I think there might be some rotation out related to vaccine news. People, you know, trying to uh, take advantage of uh, news related to all of the positive vaccine movement. But uh, in general, valuations continue to be at, you know, very, very high levels relative to history going back, uh, you know, even as far back as, you um, you know, 20 years ago, even. So yeah. it's uh, particularly in software, particularly in software as a service. Um, if you look at the um, Bessemer Cloud Index, for instance, that's, you know, at all time highs, valuation multiples are very, very high level. But there's a lot of good reason for that. Um, you know, I think our view of the, the sector is that uh, technology is gonna, is gonna continue to perform well. I think, um, I think a lot of people think of the tech sector as a risky sector sometimes, but yeah. now it feels like it's not as risky as a lot of businesses. I think, you know, I look at Shopify, I, I know that Shopify is going to be around in three or four years. I don't know that a lot of the companies that we've seen as, you know, very, very low risk companies are going to be around. Certainly they'll likely be around, but there's higher risk around companies like GE or Boeing or, you know, the auto companies. And, but I know that Shopify is going to be around and I know a lot of these cloud software vendors are going to be around and so there's a low level of risk you know just that they're going to you know be impacted very negatively by covid the second thing is that you know my household i think you know i i've used this trope before uh, a couple of times but i mean if i turned off the water and the the wi-fi in my home i think my kids would probably notice the wi-fi shut off first oh yeah so it's becoming in nanoseconds like, <laughs> It's a utility, right? Like, I mean, my iPhone's never very far away from me. And so I think of a lot of the things in the tech space are becoming almost utility-like. They're low, uh, they're very, you know, defensive or lower risk than perhaps perception would uh, suggest. And then, you know, everything, uh, interest rates are so low that uh, your ability to make money with very low risk investments is uh, your, your returns are very low. And so in an environment where the U.S. 10 year is below 1%, I think I, I heard uh, Warren Buffett talk about that as a, you know, 100 times PE. Uh, and yeah, that makes sense if you think about it. In, in an environment like that, what are you willing to pay for some of these software and technology stocks that are able to grow 20% plus and have, you know, low risk profile? So um, continue to like the, you know, the software space particularly, but the uh, tech space, I think, is, you know, very strong. And I think the setup into 2021 is, you know, also very strong. So. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. Now you brought up the cloud and, and the developments there. Uh, you've got you know Salesforce uh, with Slack. Why don't we talk a little bit about that and uh, and what uh, Salesforce is trying to trying to do on that side? Well, it's probably it's probably fighting Microsoft in general. Microsoft bundling the Teams and now there's uh, you know Salesforce is a de facto cloud vendor. Uh, Microsoft is heading in its direction and Slack. I think people are talking about Slack as being an engagement layer for Salesforce across all of the various cloud pieces that it's assembled. And so I think you, you could perhaps look at this as uh, you know a fight for the uh, cloud dominance. Um, mm. They're paying $28 billion for Slack. It's a very large acquisition, clearly important to their strategy. And um, I mean, it just underscores the importance of the cloud and how enterprises maybe more aggressively moving into the mm -hmm. cloud than you might have thought a, a year ago. There's the burning platform from all of the, um, the drivers of COVID, you know, you need to work from home. You need to have collaboration tools with your employees who are all over the place. Uh, you can't train in person, so you've got to go and get e-learning companies. You can't go into a store as easily as you used to, so you've got to, mm -hmm. you know, e-commerce and omni-channel tools are very important. So all of those things are driving all sorts of enterprise workflows into the cloud. And, yeah. Um, any, any anticipated hiccups in the in the close of that deal? Because that's next year, right? We're probably looking. Yeah, at I'm not. I'm not too sure when the close is. It, something that big is generally long. That's generally yeah. a long close. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the shift that you're seeing, you know, on e-commerce, I, I agree. And the other big shift that we're seeing right now, and it's just come out as, you know, you saw a Wonder Woman 84 is going uh, straight to streaming. You're seeing HBO doing their whole suite uh, of, uh, of releases going on to streaming. We've seen what's happening with, with uh, Disney+. Plus. Um, I mean, theaters, it's looking bleak out there on the, on the theater side, but uh, how do you see the, uh, the valuations and just, just looking forward to that whole sector of moving everything online and, and uh, streaming versus, uh, versus the regular theater, you know, theater going uh, experience? It seems like Disney's been surprising everybody. Their, their subscriber number there's, numbers there have been you know, very, very strong, despite the fact that they've got a lot of businesses that are pretty heavily impacted by COVID. I mean, yeah. it's not a good time to be running theme parks. I mean, they also have their own cruise ships, but um, you know, Disney Plus seems to be doing very, very well, and it's really underscoring the value of some of their, um, you know, their, um, their properties, like uh, The Mandalorian doing particularly well. Yeah. Um, it's it's i think it's it's a first it good star wars to, series in about 20 years so awesome yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly and it, it's it's really just uh all of these drivers around covid uh pulling people into the cloud you know some of the, i've always found it that the best time best way to invest in technology is to identify cultural change yeah. and so I mean, you, you could argue that Netflix was the first step of this cultural change away from, you know, from the blockbuster. Uh, you, no one no one would think it's normal to go and rent a DVD anymore. It's completely gone online. Yeah. And, um, you know, it may be that in the future we'll think that going into a theater is a ridiculous idea, too. Um, you know, I have a feeling that, that, you know, theaters aren't going away, particularly for artistic cinema, but... Um, it may be that the the Marvel blockbuster is going to be something that's going to be in your home so that they can get global access. If you think about it, there are how many people have access to an internet connection and have a TV as opposed to, you know, the number of people that might be able to go into a theater and buy a ticket. I mean, it could be a much larger addressable market. Yeah, and I think we got to keep in mind, too, that, you know, theaters were kind of um, in trouble before this all started over the past 20 years. And, and typically, in my experience, whenever you have an event like we've had with uh, – you know, with the recent pandemic, you, you know, it tends to accelerate trends that were already in place. It doesn't replace them. The yeah. things that were already happening continue to happen just at an accelerated pace. So that's, you know, that, that, that's a good point. That said, you know, what about the 5G network? Because, you know, you made a point here that 5G is getting real. Yeah, yeah. So um, 2021, uh, it seems as though in 2020, we've seen a lot of movement forward on 5G. Uh, you know, Apple now has um, the iPhone is going to support 5G. You got Timo talking about um, 5G network on standalone, which is key. Standalone is where there's two types of 5G. There's an initial 5G where the you're just changing the wireless network. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second step to 5G where you're changing the wireless network and you're also changing all of the back end infrastructure. And it opens up a bunch of interesting new features uh, they call it, one is called slicing it gives the ability for you know companies to run their own network like we could end up having a canaccord genuity 5g network running on a slice provided That's by interesting. you know yeah it could be something that bell uh, sells to us but it could also be bell might be disrupted it might be siemens or it might be bosch or some other you know uh, enterprise vendor who's gonna provide a standalone 5g network because it's an entirely separate network and so there's some interesting you know, ways that, um, you know, the wireless network could potentially change in 2021 as the standalone uh, moves forward. But Timo seems to be the first one to move. Both Verizon and AT&T are, you know, moving towards standalone by the end of this year, and uh, they may already be out. Um, and so, you know, 5G is definitely moving forward. And normally, you know, we would get a lot of, you know, update from the Consumer Electronics Show, from Mobile World Congress, which are, you know, some big conferences sort of at the front end of the, the year. And uh, we won't have that in the same way this year. So it'll be interesting to see how the, um, uh, the um, you know, the story around 5G develops at the beginning of the year. Normally we get a real push behind these broad technologies at the beginning of the year. Um, but I would, I would say that 2021, we'll see that move forward. Probably, you know, the iPhone adopting 5G and, you know, the carriers in the U.S. driving for it. But it's still a long way away from, you know, taking over for 4G in, in the world. In lots of countries like India still depend on 2G. So mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting trend. I think it'll move forward. Not a lot of Canadian companies to look at in that space, unfortunately. Um, there's Expo and Baylin, mm -hmm. some elements of uh, CGI. And, of course, there's the Canadian carriers. Um, 
but uh, definitely a, um, a good longer term technology trend. Yeah, interesting. Now, you know, going the other area that that, uh, that you and I have been talking about a little bit, have been uh, you're starting to see uh, digital assets become a bit more popular again, and, and maybe uh, Bitcoin's catching a bit of uh, a bid. Why don't we talk a little <laughs> bit about that? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, the last time um, Bitcoin was uh, super exciting was several years ago, and uh, twenty thousand dollars U.S. was the was the level and it, it, you know bitcoin is now bouncing up against that level again um and interesting that says the us dollar is weakening and so you could argue that it may even in some currencies be above where it was in the past um yeah. and so there seems to be a lot of exciting building behind digital assets again um you know lots of uh Financial institutions talking about their strategies as it relates to um, Bitcoin. I mean, one famous one that the uh, the, the media likes to point out is uh, J.P. Morgan. Yeah. Um, you know, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, was famously super negative on Bitcoin and digital assets, and now J.P. Morgan appears to be one of the more supportive. They're talking about uh, millennials' um, adoption of Bitcoin, eating into the demand for gold. So it'll be interesting to see how that. Uh, how that plays out over time, but um, you know, very, um, very interesting news out there around digital assets. Um, yeah, no, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, some of the numbers that are coming out of Bitcoin are, are huge again. Um, let's just move over to esports because that's an area that you know, speaking of millennials and and uh, speaking of uh, uh, hmm. you know areas that 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 I think are getting some traction going forward here. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about your, you know, the work that you've been seeing in, in uh, esports and, and how you see that whole sector unfolding? Yeah, well, we cover one company, um, EGLX Enthusiast Gaming, and um, you know they they report not too long ago, good quarter out of them. Uh, what we do see is a shift in their business away from esports and more towards the media around esports, where yeah. it seems to be where most of the opportunity is. Um, you know, esports is you know very very um, interesting uh, growth driver, but it's hard to companies in the space have had a hard time building a, a, a revenue model around it. And so, where there's been success is companies like Enthusiast Gaming that have been able to pair that with a broader media play. And and so, what EGLX is able to do is they can leverage the esports team that they own called Luminosity, and they're mm -hmm. in a bunch of different you know games that they have teams that are uh, competing there. Um, but there is a very it's very difficult for brands to reach younger people. Um, sometimes I, I've heard of the uh, millennials and, and younger being referred to as untouchables because they're not watching TV. You know, if you're Kellogg's and you want to uh, advertise the latest you know sugary cereal, you can't reach kids on Saturday morning cartoons anymore. Um, no. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing companies increasingly engaged through video games and video game lifestyle. A great example is, you know, just recently Fortnite. Yeah. They had a switch between uh, seasons and they had a, a really big in-game event that was a Marvel tie-in. And um, they had 15.3, the numbers that they shared with 15.3 million players wow. who are watching that event. And then another 3.4 million that were watching live streams on YouTube and Twitch. And so you know, you're able to get access to this very highly, you know, you know, very valuable demographic, younger people through video games, and video game lifestyle. And then, you know, bring it back into esports and e enthusiast gaming. Like they are companies that are uh, pooling these people together. And so it gives brands and, and, and companies that are looking to reach that demographic a way to do it. So we're starting to see that in enthusiast gaming. Um, we're starting to see the the success of that strategy, and um, you know, and, and another thing, Forbes they put out a um, a piece every year on esports where they talk about the largest uh, companies by valuation, and um, they made the point uh, that we just made that revenue models are difficult to uh, build in the space. And so, uh, it, interestingly, out of the uh, companies listed there, uh, EGLX Enthusiast Gaming was the um, the largest by revenue in their um, uh, in their listing, but they they noticed I think it was seventh by valuation, and so you know maybe an opportunity there. 
Well, that's interesting. Well, hey, uh, don't want to take a lot of your time up. Really appreciate you joining us uh, for the end of 2020. And uh, I think we can all agree that uh, we're happy 2020 is uh, hindsight because <laughs> uh, it has not been a fun year. Although, well, uh, I know you've been busy. I know I've been smoking busy and a lot of us around, but uh, there are a lot of other people out there that we know have been having a tough time. So 2021 yeah. is going to be so much better. Thanks again, Robert Young, Canaccord Genuity Technology Analyst. Thanks, Robert. Thank Bye. you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.